Nowadays, the majority of Slavic ethnic groups have their own country. This wasn't always the case, however. Rewind back 200 years and very few Slavic peoples had independence. As fate would have it, many were under the control of either the Austrians, Ottomans, or the Prussians. Some groups, such as the Czechs, or rather Bohemians earlier in their past, have long storied histories of their own kingdoms and monarchs. Other groups, such as the Slovaks, have been part of another kingdom for much of their existence. An important tipping point towards national consciousness for many of these groups, and the beginnings of Pan-Slavism on a serious level, happened in 1848. Like many other ethnic groups in Europe, the year of 1848 was the birth of nations, with the Hungarian and French revolutions only starting months earlier. In the now capital city of the Czech Republic, Prague, the first Slavic Congress was held. Its disputed main goal, furthering Slavic interests in, at the time, the Austrian Empire. Things had not been going well for the Slavs of Austria. The Austrians had attempted to increase Germanic influence over their land. Along with the beginnings of the rise in national fervor in the Hungarians, things were uneasy. Though the Hungarians had many credible issues with the Austrians as well. This congress, being first suggested by Slovak Ludovic Stur and Croat Ivan Kukujevic Sakinski, was organized by a group of Czech activists by the names of František Palacki, who later became the president of the Congress, Karel Zap, František Ladislav Ryger, and Karel Havricek Borovsky. The event was held from the 2nd to the 12th of June. In total, 340 different delegates attended. 42 South Slavs, 61 Poles and Ruthenians, this includes Ukrainians and modern-day Rusins as well, and 237 Slovaks and Czechs. A considerable number of guests were in attendance as well. The interests of the groups were scattered and even at some points at odds with each other. Quick fun fact, Adolf Dobriansky was actually in attendance at this congress. He was part of the Supreme Ruthenian Council. I couldn't find any more information on any other Carpatho-Rusins, so I think it's safe to say that he might have been the only one. Many Czech delegates, along with some Ruthenians, Croats, Serbs, and Slovaks, sought a closer union with Russia. As one might expect knowing Eastern European history, the Poles were not a fan of this at all. But even within a territory, people were not on the same page. No better example than the Supreme Ruthenian Council and the Polish-oriented Ruthenian Sabor. One wished to break up Galicia into two separate pieces, the other to keep the state together. Because of all these competing interests, this event was generally a mess at first. Unsure of how to even hold talks with all these different groups and about what, it took days for things to really get rolling. With Carole LeBelt proposing a new plan that was finally enacted on the 5th of June, meetings could really move forward. His plan was to issue a manifesto to all nations in Europe, stating the political orientation of this event, send a petition containing the Slavic demands to the emperor, draw up plans of promotion of cooperation and unity amongst the Slavs. The discussion was divided into three main groups that were presented earlier, the South Slavs, Poles and Ruthenians, and then finally the Czechs and Slovaks. A few things came out of this congress, but it was quite underwhelming. The first important action was a Polish-Ruthenian compromise. After a hard-fought debate between the Supreme Ruthenian Council and the Ruthenian Sabor, the two groups came to terms. Things were still not easy in Galicia, but the territory was not divided yet, and the language issue was sorted out for now. The language of the schools and government institutions would be the same one that was spoken by the people of that area. With a third promise in the agreement which would later not be fulfilled at all, and that of the Eastern Catholic clergy having the same rights as the Roman Catholics. This compromise left both sides not particularly happy, but it was still some type of political success. The other major work that came out of this whole ordeal was the Manifesto to the European Peoples. This document was a call to the Austrian Empire and anyone else who would listen to respect the natural rights of the Slavic nations. Originally, the Congress had been planned to last two days longer until the 14th, but the Prague uprising and fighting on the streets, the rest of the Congress was cancelled. Many Slavs were arrested and detained either directly afterwards, attempting to leave Prague, 
or within the coming years because of having attended such an event. Thanks for watching. If you like to see more of this content, I have plenty more available on my channel.